very warm welcome on Rwanda Television. My name is Andrew Kariba. For the first time, Inspire Me is, is going to be hosted in English, and I'm glad to have a delegation from Nigeria. Uh, there are peace practitioners from Nigeria. Students, help me to welcome them in the studio. <laughs> with me on the stage, I'm with uh, Dr. Yakubu Joseph. We are very glad to have you on the stage. Thank you for having me. Mm. Dr. Yakubu is the Nigerian country director for Mission 21 Switzerland and uh, is currently the, the coordinators have been saying for, for the Swiss based development agency uh, Mission 21. Uh, he taught at the University uh, of uh, Trebingen, if I pronounce it well, in Germany for several years. He holds a PhD from the same university. Uh, Dr. Yakubu is also a PhD holder, as I said, uh, from uh, Tübingen University. He is a German and research coordinator for the International Institute for Religious Freedom. He holds a Master of Science in Sociology from the University of Jos, Nigeria, and a Master of Arts in International Peace Studies from the United Nations Mandated University for Peace, Costa Rica. He was involved in development and peace work for two decades taking on various projects and managerial responsibilities, including as the pioneer executive director of the Center for Peace Advancement in Nigeria. He was a peace program advisor for justice development and peace commission uh, in Nigeria. He worked as country coordinator for Open Society Initiative for West Africa, Nigeria, national coordinator for Earth Charter Network in Nigeria and regional program mentor for a European Union funded program, increasing non-state actors implementation and development expertise. Uh, Dr. Yakubu, please, could you go through and tell us what's the mission of uh, peace practitioners of Nigeria here in Rwanda? What is the mission in Rwanda today? Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, my colleagues are seated here among the, the audience. And um, students, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, you inspire me by your very presence here. Uh, my colleagues are seated there. Um, we are a delegation, or a team rather, from Nigeria. We came to Rwanda uh, to undertake a course on alternative to violence project. Uh, we know Rwanda has a lot of expertise based on your history and experience, and so we are here to learn because we have challenges back in our country uh, with conflicts, and we uh, thought that we could come here and learn from the resources that you have so that we can go back and continue to, uh, with the work that we are doing. Most of us are uh, seated uh, here among the students uh, coming from Nigeria are uh, people that are working on peace. We are peace practitioners. Um, majority of the people in the group come from the Church of the Brethren. Uh, which is a church that is predominantly present in northeastern North Nigeria, the region that has been uh, affected by the Boko Haram insurgency. Some of you probably have heard about that. Um, but of course, the church spreads to other parts of the country as well. Uh, we also have people from the other sister organizations of the Church of the Brethren Peace Program. Uh, they are facilitators who go out to communities, try to train people uh, on trauma healing and also on the process of uh, healing and reconciliation. So our mission here is to learn from your rich experience uh, in the aspect of uh, how to deal with conflict in a non-violent way. And we are happy to have our trainers among us seated here too. I hope uh, we are going to be inspired by both sides. Either students are going to inspire you or we are going to be inspired by That's Dr. Right. Akubu. That's Dr. Right. Akubu, uh, a new survey in Rwanda shows that uh, up to 92.5% uh, of Rwandans today feel that uh, unity and reconciliation has been achieved and that citizens live in harmony today. Uh, what have you learned today from, from this? Yes, this is great, really. Um, we as a country have been dealing with uh, the problem of uh, lack of unity. We have unity, but we're trying to strengthen it. The issue of national integration has been a very big one for us as a country. Because mm -hmm. if Nigeria is a very big country, we have at least 250 ethnic groups, several cultural groups. We have about, diff about 400 languages. And uh, the country is so big, it's so vast, so in terms of cultural pluralism, 
you know, we are a country of different religions. Mm -hmm. We are a country of different ethnicities. We are also a country that is geographically diverse. Mm -hmm. In the northern part of the far northern part of the country, you go to the semi-arid, dry region of the country. We, have, we don't have forest there. But if you move southward, you then go to this forested part of the country. So this diversity, diversity has always been part of our life as a country. And we are always are fascinated, really, especially in these few days that we have been around to see how much really you have forged ahead and you have tried to, to build a country, uh, you know, that you see yourselves as one people. This is where we want to be. We're trying. It's not that easy because of the complexities that I have described. If you may allow me, uh, let me open the floor now to students. Anyone with any question? Uh, you told us about Nigeria being a very large country and a country of about 400 languages. And here in Rwanda, we, we, we are a small country and we only have one language. Mm -hmm. So what has Nigeria done to solve that problem of being having a large population? Like in Rwanda, there is a national uh, unity and, rec and reconciliation commission that mm -hmm. has been starting since 2003. Mm -hmm. And it has been going in the population and the people. Mm -hmm. uh, what has Nigeria done? Does it also have a commission of unity mm -hmm. and reconciliation mm -hmm. that, has, uh, that has been going in? Uh, the citizens and telling them more about unity and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, David, right? Mm. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, good question. Um, we're trying. We get, we're trying to get there. We are not exactly where you are at the moment. Um, we look at our diversities. We, say, we describe Nigeria as a, as a rainbow collection of different ethnic and religious mm. groups. You know, rainbow is so beautiful, right? So we try to see our diversity as a strength. We try to reap the benefits of these diversities. Unfortunately, um, it's not easy because we are a young country. We got our independence in 1960, and the process of nation building or state building uh, has not been easy. As you had your own experience here, and in several other countries, you know, they have had, South Sudan is having its own painful experience that all of us are praying that they will overcome it and become a very peaceful and stable country. So Nigeria, we are still struggling on different fronts. We're trying to address the issue of this disunity. So we have, for example, religious pluralism. Nigeria has, uh, religion is one key issue because um, we have almost, Muslims and Christians are almost evenly divided. So you have like 40%, 45% Muslims, 45% Christians, and 10% are people that practice African traditional religion. Not all Nigerians even be believe in these numbers I have told you. Some Nigerians will believe their own religion is more or the other. We don't have record that tells us the exact uh, proportion of the population that belong to this or that religion. That is also an issue. But on the religious front, we have the national, uh, the, the NARIC, that is the, the Nigeria Interreligious Council. The Nigeria Interreligious Council uh, is comprised of religious leaders from the two major uh, religions, Islam and Christianity. They try to come together. That is not easy, but they are trying. They're trying to promote understanding. So at different levels, we have leaders and young people like you who are trying to join hands across the divide. And oftentimes, these are not efforts that get attention of the media. But the news of conflict, violence get more attention that little efforts by ordinary people like me, by young people like you, by community leaders to try to, to, to build bridges of understanding, to reach out, don't get, don't get this much attention. At the level of uh, the ethnic groups, we've made some efforts trying to, bring the, uh, to have some kind of national dialogue. Really, we've, we've not reached that stage where you are in Rwanda. We've had some conferences 
we bring representatives of the different interest groups and ethnic groups to come and try to talk, to try to understand each other. And they have yielded some positive results, but they have not taken us there yet. So we are a country, as far as national unity is concerned, we are a country in the making, in the making. And mm. we hope that uh, we can get there. That's why we are looking out. We are looking at your own experience here in, in Rwanda. We're inspired by it, and of course we're a bigger country, but there are, you, we've learned so much that you people have done uh, after, I mean, post 1994, that you today, moving around this country, as I walk on the streets of Kigali, re I'm really inspired. My head is not able to reconstruct the past to understand what you people had gone through, because I see life is so vibrant. I see you as one people. And I see you as people who care about yourselves and care about your country. You care, even the way you take care of your environment, you don't litter, you don't throw garbage around. The way you try to respect law, you know, all these things for me are lessons that I will take home with me. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, another question from Lise Doruhango. Yes. Thank you. I'm called Afsa. My question goes like this. Before you come in Rwanda, I think you know the history of Rwanda. So what was your expectation at your first time in Rwanda? Mm. Thank you. Could you repeat your name again? Afsa. I'm called Afsa. Afsa, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I had very great expectation. As someone who studied international mm. peace, I, I was quite familiar with uh, some of what happened here in Rwanda you know, 1994, and some of the post-conflict peace-building processes that were taking place. I have to admit that I didn't expect that you've got this far mm. in reconstructing your country, in actually reinventing Rwanda and making Rwanda today. Uh, I have lived in Europe for many years, and honestly coming to Kigali has reminded, I, sometimes I forget I think maybe I'm in some kind of some cities in <laughs> Europe. And this is an African country. So honestly, you have come a long way. You have, beat my, you have beaten my expectation. Mm. I did not expect that. Um, I was expecting that I would see touch houses. Yeah, I was expecting that I would see uh, people, you know, uh, on donkeys, uh, you know, doing transportation on the capital. This is happening in some African capitals. So I didn't expect really to see that you are where you are today. So uh, I'm really quite impressed with what I have seen. And to see also for me the most amazing part of my experience mm -hmm. coming here is the healing process mm -hmm. and the national consensus that you have, you have evolved that never again. And I see almost every Rwandi that I've spoken mm -hmm. with are firmly agrees and affirms that never again. Yeah. And you embrace, you own up to the mistake of the past, and you're saying, we will build an inclusive society, a society where everyone will feel that he or she belongs. There will be no discrimination on the basis of gender. There will, not be, there will be no discrimination on the basis of religion. There will be no discrimination on the basis of ethnicity. And this really has touched me so much. And you have also a system whereby the state, through the government, must listen to the people. And you have created mechanisms where the government interfaces with the citizens to get to know what is happening. And, and this, for me, are the kind of stories because oftentimes the distance between those, the, the, the governing body, the people that govern, and the citizens can create so many problems. So I'm, I would say that this is really amazing what I have discovered here. I'm not saying that this is a perfect scenario, mm -hmm. uh, but you've come quite a long way and you have beaten my expectation. Yes, the journey continues. Now doctor is, is being inspired. You get now? <laughs> 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 yes, behind that is a lady, young lady. <coughs> 
professor you've said that you are trying to connect the di the the different like diversities in your country right and by doing so you say that you you have created a peace dialogue between the ethnic groups so according to our experience in Rwanda uh there's a peace dialogue which is called Ndumunya Rwanda this Ndumunya Rwanda is mainly to enforce the like to to make us all believe that we are all Rwandese, right? And this this Ndumunyaranda thing has has brought has uh, has brought uh, the spirit of being a Rwandese between um, among all the Rwandese. So it's like it's it has succeeded so far to a high percentage. So I want to know like in in those peace dialogues you held in the ethnic groups, I want to know what what is the main impact and what have you ha what have you gained so far what have you seen that is making progress so far thank you oh what can you learn from rwandans by the way because we no longer have three <laughs> tribes being saying uh hutu to see to i no longer have those yeah. we yeah. are now rwandans as she has said yes yeah. yeah yeah yes uh, thank you very much gloria for this question um one of the challenges for african states coming out of independence and especially countries like Nigeria where m different ethnic nationalities have been put together in one country. You have these diversities and sometimes different cultural, different political experiences. And to try to forge a national identity has always been a big challenge. Here you have made some headway. In Nigeria we are not quite there but we are making efforts. Some of the dialogue we have held have, with the impact I can say, sometimes I ask myself, as a peace worker, I ask myself, well, we work, we try to promote peace, but we hear more about conflicts. Mm -hmm. We hear more about violence. Are we making any impact? Now, as a researcher, I do what I call counterfactual analysis. I ask myself that, can I imagine a situation whereby we have not done what we are doing? Mm -hmm. What will happen? We would be in a worse situation. And therefore, and we have seen time and again that these efforts are yielding fruits at different scales. We have heard of stories at community level where this kind of dialogue. In fact, we are going beyond dialogue to what I call... Um, Diapraxis. Diapraxis is what? Living the dialogue, not just talking, okay? But living what, walking the talk. And therefore, we try to find some practical ways to engage the different groups, the different religious groups, the different ethnic groups. So we have young people from different communities, from different religious or ethnic backgrounds, playing soccer together, for example or coming out to do some activities, undertake some activities together. By doing that, they are able to come to appreciate their common humanity. And that's what we're trying to get people to understand because that is the fundamental principle of cooperation for people living together. We are trying to go beyond, what we're trying to also now look at how we can concentrate on youths because they are the leaders of, the, of tomorrow. They are the future. Young people like you, they have to grow. We have to work on them to make sure that they get rid of stereotypes. We want you young people to become colorblind so that you don't see the other person as belonging to this ethnic group or that ethnic group. Our parents tried that one. They saw that it didn't work. It brought us somewhere in 1994. In Nigeria, it brought us somewhere in 1967. You heard about the Nigerian Civil War. We've had also now Boko Haram, which is ravaging our communities uh, in northeastern Nigeria. Now, we know these things have failed. So the hope is with young people, young people like you, with the, uh, with the benefit of social media, that you can think, you can imagine a community where every young person, regardless of his race, regardless of his ethnicity, regardless of his religion, regardless of his socioeconomic background, will be having, will have hope, will have hope, will work hard 
will work hard. And if you work hard, you can become who you want to become. This is what we want to see in African countries. And we want to see that. We also understand that most of these divisions, most of these differences that we allow to hold us back, are manipulated by our elite, by our leaders. And therefore, we must find a way to hold them accountable. If we have good governance, if we have those who are in a position of responsibility held accountable, we will not get ourselves in this kind of situation. So we educate people, don't allow yourself to become instruments in the hands, hands of conflict merchants. These are people who live on conflict, who would want to sell to us these uh, stereotypes, xenophobia, and so on and so forth. We have to reject it. Therefore, we need to educate young people. We're trying to do that. We saw that in the last general elections in Nigeria. There were many Nigerians who were in 2015, we had general elections. Some Nigerians were so afraid because it was a very polarized uh, uh, campaign. Many people were looking at possibility of a war breaking out because of that election on the basis of religion or ethnicity or on the basis of sectional of geography. You know, but what something happened. We were united by what? By common suffering. The unity of common suffering brought all of us Nigerians together. When there is no electricity, by the way, we don't enjoy as much, as, as much stable electricity in Nigeria as you do here. Yes, of course. And we have more money, I guess. But we don't enjoy this. This is a basic human right. Electricity and water also. Water is also a basic human right. And this, the absence of this affects a Christian, affects a Muslim, affects uh, whatever your ethnicity is. So... The unity of common suffering mm. brought us together as Nigerians and we cast our votes. We selected our leaders because of our conviction and our desire to have leaders who will work for us, for us who will be accountable. Not on the basis of some narrow considerations of their identity. And that was what really made us not to have war. 2015 was like a tipping point. Mm. Many experts predict, predicted that Nigeria was going to go into the abyss if nothing has happened. But nothing happened. We came out strong. Today, many African countries are looking at the example of the kind of peaceful election and peaceful transition of power. Doctor, sorry to cut, you, short. Like, sorry to cut you short. You. you mentioned something about uh, religion and terrorism. Uh, from your own perspective, does really religion cause terrorism? Okay, um, this question is quite fascinating. Mm. Religion does not cause terrorism. Let me, uh, I want to make this very clear. Mm. Now, there are those who think that simply because you belong to a certain religion mm -hmm. and simply because the religions have some exclusivist claim, each cl religion claiming that I am the best, mm -hmm. that I am going to heaven, you are not going to heaven. And that that itself creates the potential for conflict to happen. But we've seen that time and again, this, these differences do not necessarily cause conflict. So what happens? Mm -hmm. So we some say, no. It's probably because of certain socioeconomic conditions. These socioeconomic conditions are when there is high level of poverty, when there is unemployment, when you have... People are, some of these human development indices that are not, we see that are not, doing, are not good, if the state is failing, then people now can seek security in their narrow identities. That is when these differences mean something to them. And political elites could manipulate this. They will use this poverty, they will use this unemployment to what? Try to recruit people into conflict. Now, but there is that tat also perspective that human beings think nobody will just walk to you as a young man and sell to you an idea to go out and fight. That you must also think about it and you must be convinced and you accept the narrative they give you. The narrative about people, the narrative that such people are bad, the narrative that such people are the cause of our problem. And once you saw they are able to sell this to you and you, say you take it, then you can go out 
and try to uh, foment our trouble. So in a nutshell, differences, religions themselves, will not, is the way people understand the religion, is the way people interpret the religion, is the way people also um, find it difficult to develop conviction to, uh, for accepting religious pluralism, religious diversity. I belong to a church. Mm. And in my church, we do not believe in one interpretation of all the verses in the Bible. Mm. That in the, in the Bible, we can read one verse and have different interpretations. We may agree in principle what that verse is saying, but in terms of expanding it and giving it meaning, certainly there will be differences in the inability to accept such differences, such diversities, can lead people into resorting mm. to undermining the peace of society through terrorism. Thank you. For those who have just tuned in right now, uh, we are with uh, Dr. Yakubu Joseph, and he's from Nigeria. He's with uh, a big delegation, a big number of delegation. Uh, they are peace practitioners, and Yehen Randa, for his study tour. Yes, another question before we go for a short break. They say... Hmm? You told us that our country that expired you. So what did you learn to our youth that you will tell your in your country the youth that will do to make a peace? Because I have say I have learned about how that team make variances in your country. So what will do to begin just training your youth how they will make that activities to, to, how can I say that, to just to, to remove that violence in your country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. At the root of many conflicts is ignorance. Mm -hmm. And one of the consensus that you made as a country is that every child has a right to education. And you have said that every child must go to school. This is an aspect for me that is so important for Nigeria to learn from. Education is the basic right, it's a right of every child. Now in Nigeria we agree, we accept, to this, we accept this principle. But in practice, this is not happening as a result of poverty, as a result of also um, cultural practices where children are put in a certain traditional system of learning uh, and not allowed to go to uh, formal schools. So the, our government is trying to address that. And uh, if we can take a cue from your experience here and mandate that every child must go to school, mm. this will help. Because Rwanda has a great hope since you are in school, since you go to school. If every child goes to school, a country has hope. Majority of people that foment trouble are people that take advantage of those who do not have education. Mm -hmm. One of the things that education helps us to do is to think critically. So no, when someone says something to you, don't just take it. You reflect, you think about it, you weigh it, and you come to a judgment about whether what you have been told is right or wrong. Okay? And then that is what we need. So we have to take education very serious. And I learned this from some of my Rwandi friends here, that uh, some of our teachers, our trainers, that education has been made mandatory. Mm. It's one thing to say is mandatory, but there has to be a commitment on the part of government and society to make that possible. To make that possible, to give every child that opportunity to go to school. You came out of this war with so many children losing their parents. By the way, I'm also a child survivor of the Nigerian Civil War. I lost my dad during the Nigerian Civil War. I, I met many Rwandese who told me they lost their parents, both parents and many more family members 
1994. Now, the state and the society had to step in to care for everyone. If we leave these young people to go without hope, without the opportunity to go to school, without home, they will be on the streets and they will be the ones that will make us unable to sleep tomorrow. Mm. So what I want to take from here is to see a system where our country will put a mechanism in place to help the children in northeastern Nigeria that have been opened by the Boko Haram insurgency in the northeast, east, northeastern part of our country. We have so many children. The UNICEF has estimated hundreds of thousands of children that are in need of help in northeastern Nigeria. We have to help them. Many of you were not born during the 1990, before 1994, 1994. Mm. Many of you were not born. Yep. Some were born, you didn't have your, your father around or your mother around, but today you are here. It took the combined effort of the state and the society to give you hope and to care for you. If we do not give our young people the support they need to have a perspective in life, to have hope, to have opportunities, we are creating a recipe for a future that we will detest. Yes. Uh -huh. One more question from Lisedo Kigali. Yes, yeah. Good. Thank you very much. I'm Kodin Garambe Joshua. I'm from Lisedo Kigali too. I have two short questions. Uh, one, how has Nigeria managed to reconciliate families that are affected by Boko Haram? As you said, uh, in the northeast of Nigeria, where Boko Haram affects much, uh, like we have 200 girls that were kidnapped uh, last time. So how has Nigeria uh, managed to bring together the affected families and their people to reconciliate? And the second question goes like this. Uh, we, we know the, the, the problem of income inequality in Nigeria, where you, you find uh, a rich is extremely rich and the poor is extremely poor. And this, I think this affects much uh, in bringing to, uh, unit and reconciliation between these people. Since the income inequality is not marching, then it's hard for them to sit and listen to the government policies. So how had Nigerian government also uh, managed to reconcile this in process? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for your two questions. Uh, the situation in the Northeast uh, is still uh, a difficult one. There are many actors, that humanitarian actors, that are on the ground trying to help uh, victims of this uh, insurgency. Um, church organizations, UN agencies, uh, the International Committee uh, for the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, uh, uh, to name a few. And government agency, the Nigerian government agency, Nigerian government also has agencies that have statutory responsibilities for catering for people that have been affected by any sort of disaster. They are on the ground working. Now, the insurgency in the northeastern part of Nigeria is unprecedented in scale. Uh, it might interest you to know that majority of the people that we, I came here with who are sitting there with you are themselves what we call IDPs, internally displaced persons. At the moment, they are not even living in their home state, their original homes. They are living in another state in central Nigeria. So we came together with them from there. So this displacement is so large that our capacity to deal with it has been overwhelmed. That's why we have also uh, called on international support to be able to help in this kind of situation. So help is trying to reach, is getting to people who are in need, but this takes a little bit of time uh, to, to be able to do that. And we are also, because the attacks are still going on, mm. they have been um, significantly uh, reduced. The insurgency uh, has been significantly reduced. The capacity of Boko Haram to carry out the kind of attacks must massive attack, dislodging communities, and moving in columns of vehicles to attack villages uh, is no longer possible because the, the military and, and also the local vigilante groups have really uh, gained the upper hand. And therefore, we only have some isolated incidents here and there. So 
The process of healing and reconciliation, I think we will say that it will be in the next phase, which is the early recovery phase. The phase where we'll be talking about recovery. But at the moment, uh, the military action is to stop the violence and then provide humanitarian relief to victims that have been affected and to make sure that their communities, those who have been displaced within Nigeria or refugees who are, who are in other countries like Cameroon and Niger are able to come home as soon as possible. Now, your uh, second question uh, is about the level of inequality that we see in, the, in Nigeria. Uh, this is quite alarming. And we've, we discover one of the main causes of this problem. There are many causes, but one of the main causes of this problem is corruption. Mm. And that is why our new president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, said, and I quote, if Nigeria does not kill corruption, corruption will kill Nigeria. So he has made the fight against corruption as his number one uh, mission. And now we are seeing that many past and present officials are being called to come and answer for some of the allegations of corruptions that are leveled against them. There have been investigations. And we are shocked to even realize the connection between corruption and conflict. We realized, we just came to realize that even the money that was meant for the procurement of arms to fight Boko Haram was diverted by some people. And so they allow the militants, Boko Haram, to have an upper hand on the military and to ravage our communities. Some people took the money. And there, so we are trying to stop this impunity of corruption, to make sure that people who are corrupt are held accountable. So this is going on right now. And it's not easy because uh, if you are trying to fight corruption, corruption will try to fight back. Uh, but we are, we are making a, a headway. And all of us as Nigerians have agreed that this is a fight that we are all united behind. Doctor, before we come to the last part of this program where you have time to challenge the students, uh, at least today, at least 95% of Rwandans feel proud of being Rwandans. And uh, the same percentage would also feel like they would do what it takes to protect and defend the sovereignty of the country. Uh, when should we feel free to travel freely in the whole Africa, that Africa we need tomorrow as young people? Thank you very much. In 2013, we had a commemoration, I think the 60th mm -hmm. commemoration of the African Union. And the uh, head of states and heads of states and governments government. agreed that 2013, I guess to 2063 will be the year the, that is the era of Pan-Africanism. So what is Pan-Africanism? That all of us feel that we are Africans. So we don't see ourselves as belonging to these different countries that, have been, that we have been put into. Okay? So, but it is still quite difficult to travel in some countries mm -hmm. in Africa. It's still so difficult. It's even easier to travel to some Western countries mm -hmm. than to come to certain African countries. We have had also where Africans are being attacked in other African countries mm -hmm. as, a, as a result of xenophobia or where... Uh, people feel that their jobs are being taken away by African migrants. They attack them. We want to put this behind us. We want to see a, an African continent where Africans feel that we are bound together by our common history. We all have a common history that we are coming. Uh, the colonial experience we have had, even Ethiopia, which was not colonized, had a rich history also that we come from a very long journey of trying to build st our states as people, as a people. We, get, we need to get to that point that Africans need to also think about how we can promote trade with one another. We also need to think about how we can have educational exchange programs. Mm -hmm. I used to work and teach also at the University of Tübingen in Germany. 
and we try to have cooperation programs with other with African countries. I facilitated the signing of MOU with African countries like you know Cape Coast in Ghana and uh, Juba University of Juba in South Sudan. We need to see more MOUs coming between African universities. We need to see young African students visiting other countries, doing semester abroad, secondary school students, going to other African countries to do semester, to learn from each other. We need to also have um, interaction where Africans, wherever they are, they feel safe. They feel that they are part of the community. They feel that they are welcome. And, and this has to be something that we can work on. And the regional cooperation bodies, we resigned this. We, uh, we gave this responsibility to the regional integration me uh, mechanisms that we have in place. But that is not enough. We need people-to-people -people cooperation. And how can we achieve that? Through education, through school exchange programs. We need also through trading. So, of course, the government can create that enabling environment. They can also put the necessary laws in place to facilitate that. But we need to see more and more people really engaging with one another. Because, after all, apart from these marks that are being given, which was not by my choice, mm -hmm. I think that I look like you. Yes, I think I look like you. I think yeah. we're the same people. And read about the migratory histories of Africa. And you'll be amazed when they tell you this is where the Margi people from Nigeria, from not, not eastern Nigeria, migrated from. The Ingas people from Plateau State migrated from. The migratory histories of, that, of Africa are quite fascinating. I travel across West Africa. And I was really amazed at the degree of mutual intelligibility between our languages. When we talk about mutual, in mutual intelligibility between languages is that some languages in Nigeria use one word to refer to water as a language in another country. Mm -hmm. So you have common words like you have here with, Ghan with Kenya, like you have here with Tanzania, between Swahili and Ken uh, Kenya Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You see that these languages, there are some words that overlap. These are pointers to the high degree of cultural interrelatedness that we have as a people. These artificial borders, these borders that have been drawn sometimes make us feel, this is what we call in political geography, <laughs> special containers that we have been put in, make us feel like we are different people, but of course but we are different. the same people. <laughs> yes, Dr. Alami, we take uh, one more question or two before we go uh, in the last session of this program had uh, I had about uh, I wanted to first listen and understand the main reason for the conflicts in, in your country and I came to a solution that the problem is not about where you belong as uh, in religion or belong as in a tribe the problem is people some people take uh, the weakness of other people as a, an opportunity and create conflict so this is an example of where you talked about people uh, who, who never go to school and people went to school to take, take uh, uh, their weakness and use it to make conflict so they can gain power or gain some interest. And, and I got uh, a solution and also a question. When it comes to people who have influence on other people, uh, when it comes to these people understanding that they should know that their problems I need that people like you or other people in Nigeria should focus on telling people that problems you have, they're not solved by you fighting your, your fellow. Because the problems you have, he also has the same problem. So uh, I think the solution Nigeria has to get from us is telling the people, teaching the people that the problem they have, they all have the same problem. But the problem is fighting is it the solution? Or sitting around and see that Yes, we are different, but being different is a lucky, it is lucky. You are lucky to be different from me because what you have, you can offer and I offer what I have. So that's an opportunity. So I think the solution for Nigeria is telling the people the problem they have is one, which is facing all of them, whether poverty, whether unemployment, and the solution is sitting together and see that we all are different, but the, the solution is, is this. That was my 
my, my what you can do. My question is, in your aspect, do you see Nigeria as uh, the major problem in Nigeria? Is it a problem of the religious? If not, is it a social problem? If not, where do you see the loot problem of Nigeria's conflict in the whole picture of Nigeria? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for that uh, brilliant suggestion uh, that you gave us. Uh, we appreciate it. Your question is a very difficult one. <laughs> I have to admit. Um, so I'll just make an attempt. Uh, it's quite difficult to isolate one cause or one issue as the core problem of Nigeria. Uh, I think it's so difficult, but I will make some attempts to uh, talk about one or two issues that I consider to be very fundamental. One, um, one Nigerian auto, which I hope some of you are reading or have read, or if you have not, I invite you to read. Um, he has passed on, may his soul rest in peace, Chenua Chebe, who is the author of the, one of the popular literature books, Things Fall Apart, had once said, and I concur, that the problem of Nigeria is simply and squarely that of leadership. So, when the crop of colonial leaders were living in our country, were living up during independence, Nigerians had to decide, we had to decide who would be in the driver's seat, given our diversity. The early crop of leaders that took over from the colonial administrators had found a way to somehow navigate the delicate terrain of ethnic and religious diversities that we have in the country. They had a vision. They had a pan-Nigerian vision. A vision in which that they see primarily they wanted to build their own regions. But to do that, they wanted to do it within the framework of a pan-Nigeria. That is, I can only achieve my own regional progress if I work for the overall progress of Nigeria as a whole, as a country. Now, they, they tried, they did their best. But as time went on, we began to experience leadership failure. And you know, if you have a ship, and the ship is sailing from point A to point B, you, with all the best navigation systems on the, on, you know, on the ship, if the captain is not there, if the captain is drunk, if the captain is sleeping, you cannot get to your destination. When the storm comes, it will rock the ship. Isn't it? This is what happened to the, to the ship of the Nigerian state. So the military stepped in several times. Many young people in Nigeria didn't know. All they knew, people like me, I was born during the time of military. And there was only little time we had a civilian administration, and then the military came again. So we had almost 30 years that the military, which was not prepared for, for democratic governance, on this, they were not prepared, the military were not trained to, to what? To pilot the ship, but they, they were on, this, on, on the wheel trying to, you know, uh, sell. And that, until 1999, that was what we had. After we returned to democratic rule in 1999, we had high hope that for now we have democracy, and democracy is synonymous to freedom. Democracy will bring about prosperity. You know, democracy will bring about the rule of law. And then we were disappointed again. The crop of leaders that took over after 1999, so many of them disappointed us. So leadership was a key issue that we have seen time and again. 
Now, a good leader, an incorruptible leader, will make sure that corruption does not thrive. That's what the present president is trying to do. He said, I'm not corrupt. I will lead by example and I will fight corruption. I will have zero tolerance for corruption. If you have an inspir inspirational leader like Mandela, he will bring healing to the nation because you have history, a history of conflict, a history of animosity. You, have, you need that kind of leader, charismatic leader, that can bring healing, that can show bravery in reaching out and trying to create understanding. And so leadership, I would say, if I'm to put my finger on one of the factors, I would put my finger on leadership because all the other problems are related to leadership failure. So leadership failure is at the center of the crisis of state building that Nigeria has experienced, is at the center of the many conflicts and violence that we have been experiencing, including Boko Haram. If there has been visionary and strong leadership, if there has been a leadership that is proactive, if there has been an exemplary leadership, we will not have gotten to where we are today as a country. But we are turning a new chapter. And that's why today I'm standing here at all. Because I believe we are turning a new chapter and there is hope. And you inspire us by your own experience and we will inspire other Africans. We hope South Sudan will also very soon catch the inspiration because our heart bleeds when we see what Africans are doing for themselves, to themselves. It's so sad. It's so painful. And this has got to stop. We need to start invent, creating, sorry. We need to start manufacturing aeroplanes. We need to start manufacturing iPads. You know what I mean? Mm. We need to start producing our computer games here. Not killing each other. Not fighting each other over things, religion and all this ethnicity. Africa has got to move. F from that point of view, as you mentioned, this brings us to uh, the last part of this uh, show. Where now you're going to challenge the students. It's your turn now. But thank you very much. I've always asked myself this question. As I live in a situation that I'm not alone, and this situation seems to weigh me down, Sometimes I despair. I feel like giving up. Sometimes I feel like losing hope. Sometimes I feel like I just need to accept the system that that is how it, can, is, it is. It is as it is. And do nothing about it. But I am also challenged by what St. Augustine, you've heard about St. Augustine, if you study religion, history of religion, St. Augustine said hope. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. To have hope is to be angry at a situation that is unacceptable. To have hope is to have the courage to do something to change it. And we as young people will have anger. We will be angry at the kind of situation that we see in Nigeria. But we must use that anger positively. We must allow that anger to give us the courage to do something to make a difference. It does matter that you make your little difference. It is the collection of these little differences that we make that can make a huge impact. Therefore, don't feel that you are too small or your action will be insignificant. Believe that you can do it. I am a Christian. Early in my life, growing up as someone whose father was killed in the Nigerian Civil War, I didn't have someone to pay my tuition. But I was determined that I would go to school. I was inspired by a scriptural passage that said, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I was in high school when I encountered this text. It says, I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. It is a plan for good and not for evil. 
to give you a future and an expected end. I claim it. I believe it. But I didn't just say amen I jumped and jumped like we see a lot today. I worked. I went out to work in the bakery. I went out to clean, to sweep. I went out to do whatever I needed to do. And I tried to be a good boy. I tried not to do anything that I believe was wrong. I studied very hard under a very difficult situation. I paid school. I graduated high school. And I worked. I went for a diploma. I graduated. I worked. I went for a degree program, bachelor's. I graduated. I worked. I went for a master's. I graduated. I said, no. I have to go outside Nigeria to study. I saved money. I worked. I sold everything I had. I went to Costa Rica to study. After that, I said, no. I have to do a doctorate that I have been able to get where I am, not because I have a father who has stolen government money. <laughs> because they want to, in Nigeria, they want to destroy the public school so that poor children like me will not have the chance to go to school and only those who have taken our money can send their children to good schools. <laughs> you have to say in your mind that this obstacle can only inspire you. That your mind like an eagle can soar to great heights. Nothing can stop you. You have to believe that. So I had made a decision on this journey that I want to get somewhere in life. Who should be my friend? Only good friends. Not everybody. What kind of things should I do? What kind of things should I not do? What kind of books should I read? I invested so much in reading books. A student that only waits to read what the teacher has given him in class, he is not really ready. You must read broadly. You should love reading. There is no pain in reading. It refreshes your mind and spirit. So desire to read and work hard. If you believe it, you can make a difference in your own world. You can make a difference in your own community, in your own country. This is the hope that I want to share with you today. That you are that one person that can make that difference. That you have got what it takes really to make Rwanda a great country, greater than it is today. You just have to believe in yourself. See the possibility and don't be weighed down by the obstacles. And work. Don't look for shortcuts. Don't look for immediate rewards. Aim high. Look for something greater. Don't look for money. Money is not the answer. Money does not give you happiness. But I tell you, if you work very well, the money will come in automatically. So any challenge, any question? So don't give up. Uh, any question to them? Any yes. Mm -hmm. I do have a question mm -hmm. for you. How many of you would like to come and visit me in Nigeria? <laughs> now, I'm so happy. I ask you this question because a lot of people hear some news about the country and they say, oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> that gives me hope that Nigeria is a country that we can believe in, that is a country that we still believe in, and is a country also that we believe has an important part to play in African integration. And we will welcome you. My colleagues are seated behind. Mm. All of us will wel welcome you wholeheartedly. And I make an offer for you. Any one of you interested in doing an internship in Nigeria for a period of maybe three weeks or one month, I offer myself to, uh, to take you as your guardian and I'll take care of your in-country cost that you'll be comfortable. Whether you want to do an internship with an NGO or any kind of organization, we can facilitate that. We'll take care of you and you will come and be the ambassador of Nigeria here in Rwanda and speak for our country. Wow. And that brings us to the end of this show. That's Dr. Yakubu Joseph, and I'm glad to have him with me on Inspire Me. And Yakubu is with a group of Nigerians who are in, on a study tour here in Rwanda in order to learn on unity and reconciliation process and post-conflict development mechanism here in Rwanda. Thanks for being with us. Stay tuned. My name is Andrew Kadeva. Thanks very much, Doctor.
Thank you. Thank you very, very much, much, Andrew. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.